I'm going to teach this morning on, and see if I have my stuff here, maybe not. Okay, go ahead, guys, get my slides up there, please. Um, and I'm going to be teaching a verse I came across. There's a place in the Bible where uh, um, Jesus is sleeping in the boat, and uh, there's a storm. And so the disciples say to Jesus, Master, do you not care that we are perishing? And I, I, I don't know, I've, I haven't been able to, I haven't felt like I was perishing lately, but I've certainly been through enough that I was wondering if God's around even caring for us at all. And so I kind of could identify with them. So, uh, um, and so in, adi- in addition, I know that there's a lot of people in our church that really have been having a, a lot of difficulty. Some have lost loved ones, some are quite sick, and there's a, a little tendency to think, uh, where is God in this circumstance? Uh, and so, um, um, and the, uh, and then in addition to that, uh, I was thinking that, you know, with the pand- pandemic and everything that was going on, it's, uh, you know, it has been a challenging time. Of course, the answer, the quick answer to the question, does he care, is he does care, but sometimes it's difficult to see that. And as people of faith, we're the people that can really recognize that the Lord is the one that cares and loves, and we can see that in this life in addition to the life to come. That's right. Now, you know, of course, the, the disciples were uh, fishermen, so this must have been a pretty bad storm if they were in this bad of shape. And, uh, and you see Jesus, they're sleeping in the front. And so the big issue is, do hardships, disease, calamity, storms, and death, why do they occur? This has been argued, wondered about through all time. The Psalms address this. And I thought I'd, in the few minutes I have, I'd give a stab at it, seeing if we could see what good can come of these things. In 1 Peter, the, the word says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Give all your worries and cares to God because he cares about you. So the word says he cares. I think our own experience is that he cares. But sometimes in the midst of difficult things, it's, it's tough. The Lord protects us. In the Psalms, it says, when the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. And another verse I've used a lot in my life is in Isaiah, it says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you and through the waters, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned and the flame shall not consume you. So the Lord cares for us, he watches over us, but there can be tough times. Now the disciples question could more accurately be, Lord, do you not care that we perish today? Because I think we all and the disciples have a sense that God, there is a God he loves as he cares, but it's in the crises and the tough times where we wonder where he's at. And that's really where our faith is necessary. And so the question is, do you not care what I'm going through at this time? Now, Jesus' response is, is a little harsh even. You know, of course, he's sleeping, so he knows what it's like to not have fear and worry. And when he wakes up, he, he rebukes the wind to the sea, and silence he commanded, be still. The wind died down, and it was perfectly calm. Why are you so afraid, he asked, do you still have no faith? So instead of comforting the disciples in this, he says, what's wrong with you guys? And he probably was even saying, you're fishermen, and here I am sleeping two feet away from you, and you're worried about this. But of course, that's the same, this is the identical circumstance we go through when we're freaking out in circumstances of life. Now, I really truly believe that Jesus' response was not necessarily a rebuke that they didn't have faith in general. It was more a rebuke that in the moment they didn't have faith. He was, that they, their faith didn't deliver for them and help them in this exact circumstance. And I think further, it, he, Jesus, who knew the future, he knew the plans he had for the disciples, he was like wondering how the disciples had not yet got how important they were going to be in his plan and how impossible it was that they were going to die that day. You can imagine the picture. If they had drowned and then Jesus, I guess, walking on water would just walk back to the shore, you know, that was not going to be the plan. And there was no way it could be. And this, this uh, you know, this applies to us also. It is very, you, we are not going to perish today. 
because God has plans for us. And like the disciples, there's ways that we, God has plans not only for us personally, but for all the people around us. He needs us as resources, people to deliver all the circumstances around us. And so I think his, his disappointment in them and in us sometimes is don't we get how important we are, how necessary my plan is for you. Don't worry about it. You're not only going to not perish today, you're going to make it through this crisis today. The Lord has a destiny for each of us that involves not only us, but family, friends, and neighbors. Our perishing today would have serious implications, not just for us, but for everyone who's around. And we know that when occasionally we lose a loved one or a friend. And it's especially important if we are good, helpful, resourceful people involved in helping establish the kingdom. So if, as all of us do, I think when we wake up, if we're resolved to contribute more than we take and to be a blessing, we are an important cog in the wheel in the circumstance, and it, we will not perish. God has plans for us. We will be helpful. Now, in Psalm 90, the word says, the years of our life are 70 or even by reason of strength 80. Now, I've always really thought that there is an actual day that I'm going to die. It's like predestined. I, don't, I haven't worried about dying too much because I think there's a day out there and it's not going to be today. And, uh, and this kind of promises long life. Um, and God's will is for us to have a long and blessed life. But unfortunately, as Alan and Steve have been teaching, God's will is not always done. And there are tragic shortening of lives. It isn't, not everybody makes it to that appointed time. And that is due to sin personal sin, but also sin of others. I mean, people kill people. People, the devil is able to sneak in these circumstances and actually bring, shorten things and cause trouble. It's due to foolishness and irresponsible decisions and seemingly random events that it ends up God's will is not always done. In fact, two verses that are pretty telling, here Jesus is uh, arguing with the Pharisees, and he says, you make void the word of God by your traditions that you have handed down. You make void the word of God. That is the word of God and his power through religious traditions and things and institutions and human-made stuff can actually hinder the word of God. Further in Acts, uh, when Stephen is uh, abrading the, the, people, the people around him, he says, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did so do you. So it is possible to resist the Holy Spirit. It is possible to make the word of God void. And the, the, all of hell, as Alan is teaching, and our own selfish kingdoms put themselves at war to make these things not come to pass. That are the will of God that could be a will of God of, of health, of blessing, and long life, but does not end up automatically being that. Now, if we actually, now, if we actually live until we are destined to die, that's day that I'm appointed to die, then surely the Lord doesn't particularly care whether we perish, right, on that day. The reason being, we do not perish, we have eternal life. And so the one thing that's cool about uh, Christianity is plan, plan B is better than plan A. You know, you, I mean, that is, what could be worse than getting to go to heaven and everything? And so, remember the, the story of the, uh, the wedding of Cana, the guy comments, the, the last wine is better. Well, for us, the last wine is better than the current wine. So, we're not, you're not going to perish today. But not only that, even if you did, it's not that big a deal. The problem is way more for the other people around you than it is for you yourself. So, in answer to the question, that, this is a, I'm trying to make a case why Jesus was upset with the question. Don't you care that we're perishing? There's a lot of reasons why that's not the question we ought to ask because we're not going to, we're in good shape, he watches over us, and in addition, if we do, it's no big deal. Now, truly, I'm convinced that it's the Lord's will that there not be disease, tragedy, premature death. I think those come from the devil. But now he did not promise, though, he, he was crucified, he lived through all the hardships of life himself. He knew that even though these were God's will, rough things would come into life. And so he doesn't promise no hardship. He just promises he'll be with us. And in John 16, the Lord says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So we're almost promised hardship. 
And if you've been listening to Steve and Alan's teachings, you know, they make a case for this, both of them. But what Steve also made a case for is the one thing we can be guaranteed of is the peace of God. That can, we can always walk in despite the circumstance. Now, can any good come from hardships? Now, the Lord may not be the author of disease, death, and destruction, but being sovereign, you know he's aware of it. You know, we're aware of it, so he's certainly aware of it. And although it's a big discussion, uh, at least he must be permitting it. You got to grant that uh, God, even though he doesn't, isn't the author of it, he allows it. Remember the story of Job, Satan, and God, in which Satan asked God to, to do all these terrible things to Job, and permission is granted. And so God is in this mix. It's not, not totally not his fault. I hate to say it. But it's like God has a part in these hardships and these things that befall us. But yet God is truly the expert at figuring out a way to bring good things from calamities. One of our favorite verses in Romans 8, 28, we know that God works all things together for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. And many of us have been through crises and realized on the other side of it, somehow that was necessary to get me to where I was going. And God does work things out. Now, why do hardships and tragedies befall us? I'm going to try to briefly go over five reasons hardships and problems are not that bad and God allows it in increasing order of difficulty to understand. The first is, when we go through tough times, we can comfort others. The second is to share in Christ's sufferings. We can actually be a co-worker with him and say yes to what he went through and be with him in it. The third thing is to glorify God by overcoming sin, the world, and Satan. The fourth is to wean us from our idols. And the fifth one is to learn to trust the Lord regardless. Now, we can comfort others in their hardships. This is a picture of the story of the Good Samaritan. My life has been pretty blessed. I haven't had that many hardships. But one hardship that was really tough, I was a physician. And in 1984, I was sued for malpractice. And just the weight that was on me that whole year, it's like you couldn't get it out of your mind. All the hardship and everything, and it, it resolved. But truly, I've had the opportunity over the years to bump into people that are going through legal trouble. And it's like when I start talking to them, I feel it. I know exactly what it felt like. Yeah. And so my comfort is not so much, oh, yeah, you know, hand padding. I could really be there in it because I know what they're going through. And so it, it is a good thing. In 2 Corinthians, the apostle writes, Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of comfort, who comforts us in our troubles so we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. And so it's, it's good to sign up for this even. I know it's tough, but I am willing to go through some stuff to be a blessing to others. The next thing is to share in Christ's suffering and identify with him. If you do any reading of the mystical literature, that'd be like Thomas Akempis, Brother Lawrence, uh, Teresa Davia, most of the Catholic saints, but even some contemporaries, they all get suffering with Christ. They embrace it. Um, Francis of Assisi said his greatest joy in life was overcoming a temptation and not falling to it. Um, and, and, and so... There are, there are those that actually are willing to say, I'm with you, Jesus, in this, and I will identify with you. In Luke uh, 14, uh, Jesus says, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So discipleship, as Alan was talking about this morning, is tied with bearing crosses in addition to following, following and willing to stand for the Lord. So number one, we comfort others because we have been through it. Number two, we identify with our Savior. Number three is to glorify the Lord by overcoming sin, world, and Satan. In Revelation, the Lord says, the original Lord says, to the one who overcomes, I will grant the right to sit with me on my throne just as I overcame and sat with my Father on his throne. Uh, Christian life is, or at least can be, if we're not all cowards, an adventure and spiritually and sometimes physically, a very dangerous and challenging thing. It requires confidence, faith, boldness, because we are warring against our own flesh, Satan, and a secular culture. And so we either just kind of hibernate and hide out, or we decide to take this stuff on, in which case there will be blood. 
Does, does anybody know what this ship is or from what story this comes? This is the Don Treader, which is a ship in the story of the Chronicles of Narnia. And it's what happens is the Pevensey kids, there's two of them now. I think it's Edward and Lucy and a, a kind of a rascal cousin of theirs named Eustace are on this voyage in which uh, the, the king of Narnia, uh, Prince Caspian, has to go and release. There's all these lords of his country that have been captured by the witch, and he has to go on all these adventures to free them up. And, but the whole idea of Narnia to kids and to us grown-ups is that the children are transported to this other world where instead of just being kids, they're like kings and queens. They're like in charge of stuff. They have all these responsibilities, and they fight in war. Now, then they have to come back to this life, and when they come back, you can see their initial disappointment, but they're always in way better shape now that they've come back. You know, dealing with bullies and everything, they know how to handle it. And similarly, if we have the guts to go after stuff in the spirit realm, and if you've had little victories, salvations, if you help people with deliverances, counsel that did something, we're in better shape on the other side of that. It's like our Narnia. It's like our adventure. Now, we cannot, this is a tough word, but you can't, we cannot ignore or faith away the problems the Lord brings to us, our own problems or other people's problems. Because our li- in our lives, in our family, because the reason it's brought to us is for us to help solve it instead of ignore it. We must recognize problems, pray for the Lord's support, follow the Spirit's leading to confront and solve Problems and sin in ourselves and those around us, relationship crises, disease and sickness, pandemics, for example, and financial threats. Our job, I mean, the fact that we have the Holy Spirit in us, we have the Lord in heaven over us, if we become aware of these things, it's a call to duty. It's not to ignore it or try to skirt the issue. We have to confront them. This is our Narnia. John 3, 8, it says, for this reason... The Son of God was revealed that he might destroy the works of the devil. And so our assignment, much more than just being good, is to take some of this stuff on. Now, did we really think it was going to be easy to take on Satan, wicked men and women, as we rescue those that are enslaved? Did do, do we not realize what we're signing up for us uh, so if we ever ask the question, Lord, do you not care that I perish? Because we've signed up for... We have signed up for war. The wrath of hell aligns itself against anyone who is willing to follow Jesus and work under anointing and power of the Holy Spirit to defeat evil. Now, this is a picture from uh, Pilgrim's Progress. Of, you know, it's the story of this pilgrim named Christian who is in the, the city of destruction. He gets saved by the evangelist, and he's headed for the heavenly city. And he encounters all these trials on the way. And one of them is this demon-like thing called Apollyon, who informs him that what's going on here because you, you were in my city and no prince lightly loses his subjects, he says. And that's the point because we once were serving this other prince. He's lost us as subjects and we are helping others be lost as subjects, but they don't take it lightly. Nevertheless, we can overcome. In, in the story, he ends up, a, a Christian goes from being kind of intimidated to just absolutely rebuking him, saying, this is the Lord's highway, just to get off. Now, we are the Lord's hands and feet. The Lord is invisible. His spirit encourages and moves us, but in the physical realm, our bodies do the work. It's not as magical and spiritual as you think. We must speak, persuade, comfort, aid, perform physical tasks. The Lord's Spirit is behind these activities, urging and empowering us, but we are the interface that touches the non-spiritual natural world and changes things. It doesn't work other ways. In the computer analogy, it's like God's the programmer. It's like our mind is the software he's designed, and our bodies are the printers, the robotic arms, you know, all the things that ends up getting this stuff out. And so without... The accessories to the computer, it's all theoretical. It doesn't happen. So, we, hardships are brought into our life to comfort others, to identify with the Lord's uh, suffering, and for challenges of us to war against. Now, the fourth thing is to wean us from our idols. 
This is a tough one. Here's some people worshiping the sun. Here's some idols from the Old Testament. That's the, the golden calf on the left. On the right, that's Ashtoreth, who's the goddess of provision. And you can see it looks like uh, she's a nurturing god, if you get my meaning drift there. Um, then there's Baal and there's Moloch, who they sacrifice children to. Now, the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, the pagan nations around Israel worshipped idols and statues and tempted Israel to do the same. These objects made with human hands represented pagan gods, demons. The Old Testament prophets, a great deal of the prophetic teaching is taking on these gods and these idols and saying they're made of wood. And a lot of it is mocking these idols. Remember Elisha, Elijah in the, 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 the Baal story? And, but truly, the, the uh, prophets understood that these weren't just pieces of wood. There were demons in power and behind it that they were taking on. Now, there are three types of idols that mankind worships. One is idols of the creation. That is, we worship the creation instead of the creator. Creation worship idolatry. The problem with it is it dethrones God so we don't have to recognize his lordship and obey it. The different religions that talk about God as this diffuse thing or in trees or something, they're just getting off the hook because there's a God that you got to obey that's personal and will judge you. And so all that stuff sounds like it's fun, but it's a way to dethrone God. And it's an attempt to reduce and control God. Now, in contemporary life, this would be radical environmentalism and pagan worship, but it's not just tree huggers. This includes anyone whose passion and attention is devoted to seeking out the pleasures, delights, entertainments of creation without worshiping, serving, honoring, and thanking the Creator. Now, when I got that point, for the first time in my life, I really understood why it's a blessing that God has church. And, and you know, the church is maligned all the time, and they try, try to make a case that it's rote and all this stuff. But there's some logic in setting up a day Sunday and a day Wednesday, or at least on for an hour or so, I, instead of all my energy and worship going into all these things of creation, giving God a little bit of credit and worshiping him, thanking him, getting together with other believers and living, li listening to his word. Because I guarantee the default is to fall away. The normal is to be less in the word, more, more uh, controlled by the word, world, less in the word, and uh, just falling away from the Lord. Now, the first, the first idols were the, crea the creation. The second are idols created with human hands. Now, entities that we accumulate for ourselves can be our idols, objects, homes, cars, clothes, people, political leaders, influencers, what a, what a term, movie, music, and sports celebrities. And then even ideas or concepts, Alan was talking about uh, the, uh, the philosophies and rudiments of, of this world, such as consumerism, prosperity, political uh, affiliation, nationalism, I hate to tell you, but these, if they're above the pure worship of God, they are idols. This is idolatry. Now, these objects and ideas powerfully invite creation worship and created thing worship rather than God worship. They distract from the only worship that is permitted and legitimate, which is the worship of the only true God. Great example of what can happen with this in Acts 12. On the appointed day, King Herod, this is Agrippa the first. Uh, donned his royal robes, sat on his throne, addressed the people of Tyre. They began to shout, this is the voice of a God, not a man. Immediately, because Herod did not give glory to God, an angel of God struck him. He was eaten by worms and he died. Now, pretty dramatic, but this is an example of some people putting somebody on a pedestal and the person receiving the pedestal. Dangerous thing. Now, all things, including God's ideas and philosophies that are made with human hands, are destructible and subject to death and decay. These objects, people ideas, are quite powerless to save us. The Lord will pull them all down. Now, the third thing is the demon gods behind the idols, and the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians reminds them that he said he didn't, he didn't worry about it when he eats food that's been sacrificed to idol, but if he becomes aware of it and knows it's going to cause anybody to stumble, he says, well, you know, by the way, you know, they're really sacrificing the demons behind this. So there is power behind all of this, and it's not just food. It's not just wooden statues. Now, we tend to make idols out of things that entice us 
temptations, which can lead to addictions, things we fear, health issues, financial loss, loss of loved ones, political issues, we start to obsess on these. Things we trust, family, friends, pastors, government leaders, doctors, lawyers, we can develop a dependence on them. And things we need, food, money, acceptance, we can develop cravings. And addiction, obsession, dependence, and cravings are thoughts that remove God from our heart. The peace is gone, and that is why these are idol-like. None of these things are bad enough themselves. They're helpful resources. But if we look to these things as our fulfillment, idolize, obsess over them, if we are disappointed when they let us down, if we give them more power to solve our problems than God, they have become an idol. Now, when we make, make people or things are idols, the Lord will tear the idol down, will shame the idol, and will disappoint the worshiper. Always. Now, the pandemic, i got to address this for a second. Its consequences have been incredible. The disruption of our lives, a threat to our health, Elimination of live entertainment, sports, the loss of conveniences. Remember the toilet paper crisis? Things we, it, there's a, this is kind of rough, but this actually had the opportunity to wean us away from some of the stuff we were relying on. Okay, to, a, to the degree to which we were made upset, complaining, ungrateful by the world, politics, economics, cultural decline, the virus, is the degree to which we rely on these things and idolize them. That's the barometer. If this stuff doesn't make you upset, you're okay. But if we're upset all the time, that means we put too much stock on all these things. Ribbity said, before the gods destroy a man, they make him mad. Do you get that? So beware if you're being very aggravated by the circumstances because the gods behind it are after you. Now, the pandemic, I am positive that evil and the satanic is behind the pandemic. This is a supernatural phenomenon. Likely crept in due to global sinfulness, who knows? But there are real physical consequences to the pandemic. We are called to oppose it. Prevent its spread, attend its victims with spiritual weapons, prayer and ministry, but it's also okay to use physical weapons, disease control, medication, and vaccines. And I'm appealing to us Christians that those of us that, that major in one area, the prayer and intercessions, go for it. Those that major in the other area, like medical workers, go for it. And let's just not judge each other. Let's love each other's participation. It's a big problem. You can pitch in from all different directions. It's not as if one thing's going to solve it all. So we're allowed to address these things, and it's a good thing. A quote from a previous time of plague. Many are much too rash and reckless, tempting God and disregarding everything which may counteract death and the plague. They disdain the use of medicines. They do not avoid places and persons infected by the plague, but lightheartedly make sport of it and wish to prove how independent they are. This is not trusting God, but tempting him. God has created medicines and provided us with intelligence to guard and take good care of, of the body so that we can live good health. We should act like a man who wants to help put out the burning city. For what else is the epidemic but a fire, which instead of consuming wood and straw, devours life and body? Now, this wasn't an old, a doctor of times past. This was Martin Luther who said that. So one of our buddies had actually made this case. Now, hardships and loss of idols can help wean us from these idols. If through the experience we become better and not bitter, 1 John, dear children, keep yourself from idols. This is not an Old Testament guy. This is a New Testament guy way past the time when Israel was falling to the wooden idols. These are the idols that John is talking about is the idols that I'm talking about because we don't worry about Baal that much anymore. He's behind the scene, but not in front. So that was the fourth reason. The fifth reason that, we, that hardship is brought into our life is to trust God in every circumstance. There is not a direct immediate relationship between sin and its consequences. Loss, death, disease can occur to the most godly people and lives are often tragically cut short not through their own fault. Does anybody know who these two people, who's the person on the left? Keith Green, Keith Green. who's on the right? Rich Mullins. And these are both contemporary Christians. You know, I have said often with my life, I was this crazy wild kid I got born again, and I think if it wasn't for contemporary Christian music, I don't know if I'd be still around. 
I mean, I, I was so rebellious that that helped me stay close. And of course, Keith Green died in a plane crash. Uh, Rich Mullins in a car wreck. But these were wonderful performers. You know, they had the life ahead of them and everything. And I remember the day of Keith Green, just like I do almost the Kennedy assassination, how much that affected me. But the point being, rough stuff happens. What about the loss of infants, children? There were 6 million Jews killed in World War II and 60 million people died, half of which were civilians. So the pervasiveness of evil, the power of evil in humans, the plotting of Satan, evil men, often prevail temporarily in this life. And bad stuff happens to good people. So the point is not, it's not all the direct correlation with their own sin. It's dangerous out there. Psalm uh, 73 is a good study. Uh, that is where the psalmist is asking these questions, saying, why is it that the wicked are doing so well, and why are we having such a rough time? But our response is really intercession, acceptance, and like Alan was teaching, gratitude. Somehow, in all circumstance, and why are we being grateful? It's not because we're being stupid. It's because we know the end of the story. We know, we, we remember how he has delivered us from circumstances before, and we know that this is going to be okay. There, it, it, we can be thankful just because of our history with God and our future with God. So, and Job says, though he slay me, yet I will trust in him. Now, that is a statement of how much we can trust God. So, in summary, uh, Karen, if you want to come up. Uh, the Lord cares if we perish today, at least. Not so worried about the future. He has a destiny and a plan for our lives because he loves us, and he loves those that we can positively influence and bless around us because he knows they need us, at least today. And, of course, he has plan B, which is eternal life, which is better than plan A. The Lord is with us in hardships. We will be rewarded if we endure and overcome. It is an honor to share the Lord's sufferings. It is good to try to be weaned from our idols. And it is good to fall on the mercies of God in tough circumstances. The only real loss that we can incur is if we if we fail to see the Lord's hand at this, we don't grow through it and we become bitter instead of better. And that happens to some people. That is loss. That is the only casualty here for a Christian is this. Um, if the, so we have this teaching. The teachings you receive here, the Lord speaking to your hearts, remembering what he's done for you in the past, these are, these are arms, these are, I mean, these are weapons that we can use to make sure in a tough circumstance we don't start to fade away, we don't start to uh, become bitter instead of better, but realize we can grow through the circumstance and it can be glorious. And so if we lose our peace, that passes understanding. God truly is good. We will recognize this in heaven. Well, in fact, everybody's going to recognize it when knees are bowed. But as people of faith, we get a chance to recognize and proclaim it now. And that is the challenge Alan is talking about, that we can say God is good, even though these bad, tough stuff is going on, and we can stand for the truth of the word, the truth of God, the glory of God. In them, the word says, the Lord is good, a refuge in time of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. And here's kind of, this is what it must have looked like. You know, after the storm. And this is the way it does look like after our storms and will look like in the future. So, Heavenly Father, I pray that uh, your word would, uh, would affect us. And I pray, Lord God, that there would be responses in our hearts, whatever way you ask, be it just an acknowledgement of your goodness or a de demonstration in other ways. So, uh, so we're going to uh, do a worship song. I'd like you all to stand. We do have some opportunities for anybody that wants. The altar is open. If you would like to come forward in between you and God, just make some resolutions and say, yes, Lord, I'm going to follow you in this. Uh, Steve is going to be available to give communion over here. Um, Blake and Devin can be over here if, uh, you, if uh, anyone wants any ministry. Uh, if there's any need for salvation, then Bruce can help. And then the baptistry is open. You know, the baptistry... Having been in it several times, it's like, you know, even though the main event is salvation, another event sometimes is, oh, if we get the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but sometimes there is pivotal times in your, our life when we really get what God's up to in our life. And interestingly, sometimes it's in the baptismal waters that many people in our church have found that. 
Like a, it's like a step higher or whatever where we really get uh, what God's doing and personally experiencing him. So uh, we're going to sing a song, and then Karen will close. But uh, if anybody wants to come forward for some ministry or whatever, you're more invited. Bless you all. As we leave today, um, we know that God is good. And we know, like Trevor was teaching, uh, it's very possible we'll face um, challenges this week and trials, but we know that God is good. So as we prepare to leave, let's just declare that together. The goodness of God, and He is good. All my life you have been faithful.
you to know that the altar is open for you to come to this morning. Also, we have Blake and Devin over here, anything for prayer, healing, and we also have the baptistry open. Now, the reason I came up here, because there's, I felt like the Lord said, Alan, there's somebody debating if they should be baptized today or not. If you're that person and you're debating, you're the one reason I'm here. The Lord says, come, let's get it done. Amen. be with you as you go through this week. Um, Just a reminder that Melissa Grogan will be upstairs to meet with anyone who would like to volunteer to help with the children. We need your help to start Children's Church back. So Melissa is upstairs, and as Alan said, Michael Fox is here, and Pastor Steve is here for communion, and Blake and Devin are here to pray with you. So may the Lord be with you, and just remember God is good all the time, and all the time God is good.